Hello everyone. Today I wanted to talk about a very important book and that is Why Meadow Died and this is by Andrew Pollock and Max Eden and I will pop up a screenshot. So if you would like to order a copy. I don't really know how to describe this book so I'm just going to jump right in. On February 14, 2018, Nicholas Cruz opened fire with a semi-automatic rifle at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, killing 17 people and injuring 17 others. Cruz fled the scene on foot by blending in with other students, but was later arrested without incident and charged with 17 counts of premeditated murder and 17 counts of attempted murder. This was the deadliest high school shooting in U.S. history. This surpassed the Columbine High School massacre that killed 15 people in Colorado on April 20th, 1999. <clears throat> One of the murdered students was Meadow Pollock, whose father, Andrew Pollock, justifiably wanted answers after his daughter's senseless and tragic death. So with the help of Max Eden and others who are named in the book, he launched his own investigation. This book is about the Broward County School District. Superintendents follow orders from federal bureaucrats and social justice activist groups. Those folks view students and schools as statistics on a spreadsheet. They slice every data set by students' race, income, and disability status, and then blame every inequality on the teachers. They view schools as laboratories for social justice and engineering and force politically correct policies into schools based on the assumption that teachers are too prejudiced to be trusted to do the right things. One policy is known as discipline reform or restorative justice. Activists and bureaucrats saw that minority students were being disciplined at higher rates than white students and rather than recognize that misbehavior might reflect problems and inequities outside of school, they blame teachers for the disparity. They essentially accused teachers of racism and sought to prevent teachers from enforcing consequences for bad behavior. Superintendents then started pressuring principals to lower the number of suspensions, expulsions, and school-based arrests. Nationwide, this pressure to reduce discipline is especially strong when it comes to students with disabilities. The bureaucrats and activists think that teachers unfairly discipline them as well. In truth, students with disabilities are disciplined less often than their peers. At the same time, principals also face pressure to educate students with disabilities in the least restrictive environment possible. This means pushing troubled kids into normal classrooms rather than giving them the specialized services they need to address their issues. So kids with severe behavioral problems are forced into classrooms where their needs are not being met and principals have a strong incentive to ignore their misbehavior. This works out well for superintendents who can advance their careers on manipulated statistics, who then reward their principals for not documenting problems so that their school's data looks good. Emotionally, this was a hard book to read. Nicholas Cruz was an obviously struggling, challenged student. The school system had the resources to help him in a specialized program, but didn't in the name of being progressive. Because of the politically correct choices made by authorities at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, 17 people were shot down in cold blood and 17 others were wounded. The school then failed to adequately address the trauma of the survivors by offering proper qualified counseling sessions, nor were authorities interested in answering questions on how this event could have happened in the first place. Instead, Superintendent Runcie was more interested in using the tragedy for a platform on gun control. But most disturbing of all, outside of all of that, is the fact that people actually sent messages to Andrew Pollock saying that he deserved to have his daughter murdered because he was photographed outside of a hospital on the day of the tragedy, desperately trying to find out where his daughter was wearing a Trump 
campaign t-shirt. I would like everyone to just digest that for a moment. Would that have been appropriate had he been wearing an Obama campaign t-shirt? We are, in our lifetime, going to have presidents we don't agree with, we don't like. But to actually get on your computer and send a message to a grieving father who will never see his child again and say that he deserved to have his daughter murdered because you perceive him to be a Trump supporter. You probably, if you are doing something like that, need to sit down and take a look at your life. That is just beyond outrageous to me. So why read this book? This book is about exposing what went wrong at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School so that parents across the country can learn from this tragedy, find out what's happening in their own children's schools, and keep their children safe because all children, no matter what ethnicity or religion, deserve to be safe in school. Period. The book does describe and go into some detail about Nicholas Cruz and even as Andrew Pollock admits, and you can tell it, as it comes across in the book, at least to me, he has compassion for Nicholas Cruz. And after all that has happened, I actually think that that is amazing. And he is just able to view all of the ways in which life had failed this young man. Nicholas Cruz's birth mother, Brenda Woodard, was a career criminal and a drug addict. She had been arrested 28 times for crimes ranging from drugs and car theft to weapons possessions, burglary, domestic violence, and was using crack while pregnant with her eldest child, Danielle. In middle school, Danielle was placed in her grandmother's care when her mother was sent to jail. Danielle, in turn, has been arrested 17 times and is currently serving an eight-year prison sentence on charges including attempted murder on a police officer. Brenda was also arrested for possession of crack cocaine while pregnant with her second child, Nicholas. He was born on September 24, 1998. Three days later, Jacob Cruz and Linda Kambatovich effectively bought him for $50,000. As an older Jacob was 62 and Linda 49, and then unmarried couple, they had difficulty adopting through tra the traditional system. So they paid Brenda's lawyer for the expenses associated with transferring custody of Nicholas. Brenda gave birth to Nicholas's half-brother, Zachary, in prison a year and a half later, and Linda and Jacob adopted him as well. From the time he learned to walk, Cruz displayed deeply disturbing behavior. Former neighbor Trish Duvaney recalled, my four month old son was crawling on the back patio and Cruz threw my son into the pool. Cruz was only two then. At age three, Cruz was kicked out of a private pre-K program because he wouldn't stop biting other students. Linda brought him to specialists from the Broward County School District and they determined that at three years and five months old, Cruz had the mind of a child who had just turned two. He was diagnosed at that time with a developmental delay, later with a speech impairment, a language processing deficiency, and attention deficit disorder. Specialists determined that because of his propensity to bite, pinch, and scratch, he required maximum teacher assistance to interact safely with peers in his public school pre-K class. For his two years of pre-k he had to be placed in a restrictive harness in order to ride the school bus 
In June 2004, Cruz's kindergarten teachers met with Linda to discuss his aggression and animal fantasies. They explained that he seemed to identify as an animal. He often crawls on the ground, pounces on other students, makes seemingly animal-like growling sounds, and grimaces while holding his hands in a paw-like manner, they said. This was far beyond normal child's play. His teachers recorded that he was impulsive with no sense of boundary. He acted out his fantasies, often explosively, in expressing feelings of stress and anxiety. He appeared to react more aggressively than other children. After the meeting, he was labeled as requiring Exceptional Student Education, ESE, similar to special education in other states due to his emotional and behavioral disability. Two months after the meeting, Cruz walked into his kitchen in tears. What's the matter, Linda asked. Did Daddy punish you? Cruz replied, nope, Daddy's dead. Jacob had died of a heart attack in front of Cruz a trauma that could do lasting and profound damage to even the most stable of children. Later that month, Cruz entered kindergarten in a self-contained classroom for ESE students with behavioral disabilities. By the end of the year, Linda decided that he should repeat kindergarten to create a stronger foundation. By the end of his second year of kindergarten, he had transitioned successfully into a normal classroom and began first grade in 2006 as a normal student. But two months in, his teacher reported that she was unable to control his aggression. By the end of first grade, he had to be physically removed from the classroom on an almost daily basis, often several times a day. For second grade, Cruz returned to a self-contained classroom for ESE students with behavioral disabilities. Now, I don't want to go through the whole thing for you, but this is essentially his career in school all the way up until high school and this is documented and as someone who worked with special needs children I don't understand how he was mainstreamed into regular high school and while not on the same level I share Mr. Pollock's frustration that he was put into regular classes because not only is this disruptive to the other students, it's disruptive to the teacher, it's doing a giant disservice to the student who is struggling themselves. They are not getting the education they deserve and it is setting them up for failure in life following high school. So the book also talks about a program in Broward County called Promise. It is hard to understand the discipline program. Um, they have something called multi-tiered system of supports and the discipline matrix and all of these are explained in the book. There's a serious offenses and crimes policy, and you have to commit so many of the crimes or offenses before you are then put into the Promise program, or you are sent to the Promise Center. And Promise covers 13 specific nonviolent misdemeanor infractions. Andrew Pollock says this is a false characterization as Promise covers 10 nonviolent misdemeanors, including theft, alcohol, drugs, threats, and vandalism, one violent misdemeanor fighting, and two non criminal conduct offenses, disrupting a school function and disorderly conduct. Students must commit four promise eligible misdemeanors per year before consultation with law enforcement even becomes an option. At the fourth misdemeanor, the promise in agreement instructs school resource officers to issue a warning, call the student's parents, or refer the student to the promise program. If further support is needed, but not available at the school level, the officer may call the district office for guidance. After exhausting all of the above options, the officer may consider placing the student under arrest. 
So reflecting on the message of this agreement, someone um, in the school district essentially said, when that program started, we took all discretion away from the law enforcement officers to effect an arrest even if we chose to. And then the book goes into an in-depth look at what occurs within the Promise program, but the message it sends to students is very clear. As Runsey tells incoming Promise students in a video message, you know, this is the land of the free, home of the brave, and people aren't going to be free when they're connected and constrained by the juvenile justice system. The book does also give a timeline of events on the day of the shooting at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and talks about the actions of several people who gave their lives trying to either stop Nicholas Cruz or protect their students. And the book does go into a group of concerned parents and teachers trying to make some changes and elect new people for the school board and all the work that still needs to be done. I know I am not giving a lot of detail on this book, but honestly, this book is emotional. It's hard to describe. It's an emotional read, and it's not an emotional read because people died per se. It's an emotional read because you can see where there should have been several things in play within the school system that stopped Nicholas Cruz from walking into this school and committing this atrocity and everyone would be alive to this day. And I just can't say it any simpler than that. So the anger I felt reading this book, the extreme sadness I felt reading this book, all of that is something that I think people need to feel for themselves. I think it's a book, if you have children, I think it's a book everybody needs to read. I think it's a discussion that we need to have. Andrew makes the point of our airports are safe, terminals, subways. Why is this still happening in schools? This sh there should have been one school shooting and that should have been the end of it. And I do agree with that statement. He is asking the hard questions. And I think you, if you are a parent, need to read this book. You need to take a look at the policies that are in your child's school. You need to allow yourself to have the emotional reaction to all the ways everyone failed. Nicholas Cruz, everyone failed. Meadow Pollock and all of the other people on this day and allowed this tragedy to occur. And I think that this book is so important that I am going to be doing a giveaway on my channel. So leave me a comment below and let me know why you would like a free copy of this book. I am going to draw one winner probably over Thanksgiving weekend and I will announce that on my channel and on Instagram and I will send you the book. I believe we need to be having this conversation about our schools, about policies in our schools, ways to keep children safe, and how we are accomplishing those goals. So, have you read this book? If you want a copy of the book, please leave me a comment below. I will be doing a drawing. If there is a book you would like me to review, please let me know also in the comments below. As always, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next review.